Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church here on this All Saints Day, or you might want to think of it as Reformation Sunday. Yesterday, October 31st, it's Reformation Day. For those of you who don't know, Reforma- uh, it's called Reformation Day because in 1517, on October 31st, Martin Luther went and he nailed 95 theses on the door of church in Wittenberg, and that was the beginning, if you will, of the Protestant Reformation, and he probably had no clue that's what he was pushing into action, but we kind of look back as that being the starting point of the Reformation, and Presbyterians are strongly a part of the Reformed tradition, that is at the heart of who we are. So, welcome on this Reformation Sunday. There are a few things this week that are different than normal. We don't have anything on the day it normally would happen. <laughs> there is no yoga on Tuesday night. Um, we have it on Wednesday night. Uh, a little personal privilege for me, Tuesday night is my 30th anniversary and uh, I'm going to bump yoga back a day so I can spend the evening with my wife celebrating our anniversary. Uh, but no, the Wednesday at 6.30, we will have yoga. And then Thursday at 6 o'clock is our regularly scheduled session meeting. So session members, please note that, and I will be sending out a link to you later in the week. You might have noticed this morning we are set up for communion. It is Communion Sunday. I just wanted to point that out real quickly so that if you'd like, you could pause the video now and go get whatever you need as communion elements for later in the service. Maybe a bit of juice, something to drink, some bread, some crackers, something like that. And that way, When we get to it during worship, you can just move right into it, and we don't have to interrupt the flow of worship, but you can enjoy the sacrament while you're in that kind of holy space of having sung praises, listening, and having listened to God's Word. So pause the video now if you need to go get some uh, elements for communion. And now we need to kind of switch gears, right? Because... We've been busy having a week full of activity building up to Halloween yesterday, and maybe our minds and hearts are in different places uh, than worship. So to bring us kind of home to worship, if you will, I'm going to light these candles as a sign of Christ present with us. Nice new fresh candles. And also, oops, thought I had that one lit. New wick takes a little more effort. Um, and also, one thing that's become kind of a custom for these online services is to draw our hearts and minds together by just taking a big collective deep breath together. And it's also a way to kind of slow down, settle down. Breathing is one way we can move our emotions into a kind of a leveler place. (laughs) So, take with me a great big breath, breathing in, and then let it out. And as you do so, just let go of anything that might distract you this morning so we can be fully present to God for worship. And to begin the activity of worship, we're going to focus on listening to a prelude. Enjoy the prelude now.
please join me in our call to worship. O oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God's steadfast love endures forever. And let's begin worshiping God together, singing our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. book of Jeremiah, we are told, This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds, and I will remember their sin no more. Friends, let's come before God confessing our sins, using this prayer, saying, Lord God, only you are holy. Yet we imagine that we are righteous, excusing our own faults while pointing out those of others. We are quick to lay burdens upon our neighbors, but slow to help with their own. We take credit and give blame. In spite of grace you have shown to us, we are slow to show mercy. Forgive us, O God, and wash us clean, that we may serve you with joy and thanksgiving. And let us now silently confess our sins before God. Amen. Take comfort in these words. Sisters and brothers, God has made a way where there was no way. In Christ Jesus, evil and death have been vanquished, and we live in a state of grace. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And let's honor God now by singing together the Gloria Patri.
please join me in affirming what we believe using the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join me in prayer before we look at God's holy word this morning. Most gracious God, we've been given a tremendous gift in the gift of your holy word. Thank you so much. As we turn our attention to it, may the Holy Spirit guide and lead our listening, and may the Holy Spirit anoint the words of my mouth that they may give you glory, honor, and praise ultimately, and help us to follow you more deeply. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. All right, we're going to read this morning uh, Psalm 43. As our Old Testament lesson, I invite you to join me in doing so. Listen now to God's holy word. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From those who are deceitful and unjust, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the harp, O oh God my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? For hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my help and my God. And then we're also reading from the Gospel of Matthew this morning. And this is Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds, and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and at the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, well, let's dig into this text. And I have a lot more notes than I typically do. I hope that's not a distraction or maybe moments where I need to pause and kind of make sure that I'm not leaving something out uh, because there, there's a lot of odds and ends of details here that I don't want to forget. And I want to start with just looking at the text and looking at the struggle of the hour that Jesus was facing in the life of God's people. Um, he was having to stare down some corruption, if you will, within the church. And it's a corruption that 
in many ways, I think, pops its head up again and again in the life of God's people uh, when leadership within the church begin to become fixated on their own power, their own status, their own recognition, and the people of God begin to suffer because of that. It was happening in Jesus' day. It was at the heart of the Reformation, and I'm going to spend some time on the Reformation if you're not real familiar with that, because today is Reformation Sunday. We stand a day after, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a day after the anniversary of Martin Luther, young man back in the 1500s, nailing to the door of a church in Wittenberg, 95 essentially reforms that needed to be made or attacks on things that were going on that he felt were heretical. So we see this abuse of power pops its head up again and again in the life of the church and the life of God's people. I think we stand in a time of reformation right now that has a very different flavor but nevertheless, I think our response is the same, should be the same as what Jesus calls for. It should be the same in many ways that I think uh, Martin Luther was calling for, for if you get beyond the particulars of his context and get to the heart of what he was doing. That'll all make sense by the time we get to the end of sermon, but hang on as we, uh, we head that way because I think this is a word we really need from God right now in what to me is a tumultuous time at many, many levels within our culture. So let's start by digging into what Jesus uh, uh, kind of went after with the uh, religious leaders of the day. There were three big problems that he pointed out. Uh, the first one was that they burdened the people. And I don't know the range of that, and Jesus doesn't go into details, but I do know that one of the things that gets lifted out in Scripture is the financial abuses that went on in the temple. You may recall that Jesus went into the temple and he overthrew the uh, tables of the money changers. Uh, the money changers were these guys who had tables set up in the temple, and people would come with uh, and need to get a sacrifice. There were certain sacrifices that were necessary to be made in the temple at different religious feasts and different times. And you would come in and you would need, people would pilgrimage from all over the place and they would come and they want to buy, uh, you know, a goat or whatever it was that they needed to sacrifice. And uh, or lamb, I should say. They would want to sacrifice a lamb or there were a variety of other things. And they'd need to purchase it. Oftentimes they didn't travel with it or didn't have one. And what would happen is these guys would not recognize their, they have to use temple currency in order to do it. So you would have to exchange the money that you had for money that would be good in the temple. And they had terrible rates on these exchanges to exploit money out of people who were trying to honor God and trying to follow God. The law. That was just one way that priests, Sadducees, whatever the temple authorities, maybe that's a better way to put it, the temple authorities were burdening God's people at that time. So he's pointing at that kind of thing, burdening people. These folks also just absolutely loved an audience, and he talked about that in a couple ways. They would dress for attention, they would wear broad phylacteries, and if you don't know what a phylactery is, there's these little prayer boxes, it's like a leather box with prayers in it, uh, and you'd bind these things on your forehead and on, on your arm to hold over your heart, and it goes back to some Old Testament scriptures. Uh, but they would have these, they would make sure that they had very obvious, I'll call them prayer boxes instead, maybe that's a more helpful reference for us. And then they have, on their robes, you had fringes that were related to prayer. Well, they make sure they have these tremendously long fringes that everybody would notice. So they were 
ostentatious in their religious regalia, basically saying, oh, look how dedicated I am and fervently, extravagantly dedicated to prayer because these things were associated with prayer. And they loved to be in the marketplace and have people recognize them and call them rabbi and and just revel in the status that they had, making sure they had the best seats in the marketplace. They had the best seats in the synagogue where everyone would see them and know by their position that they were someone who was very, very important. Now, the strange thing is, is it sounds like they actually were teaching good things because Jesus said, do what they tell you, all right? Practice what they're teaching, but don't behave like them because their walk obviously wasn't matching their talk. Their walk was all about what would bring attention to them and gave them power and authority over other people. And Jesus said, you know, basically, ignore that nonsense. Don't get caught up in that. I want you to focus on basically two things. He said, you know, you have one father. That's who you need to focus. Don't call anybody father. You have one father, and that father's in heaven. And don't call anyone else rabbi. I don't want you to play into their game. You have one teacher, and that one teacher is the Messiah. So he did something very simple. Your allegiance is not to be to these men who pride themselves and want everything pointing at them. Your allegiance is to your heavenly Father and to the teachings of your Master, the Messiah, which was Jesus, of course, right? So pointing to just two things. Honor your Father in heaven follow the teachings of the Messiah, His Son, Jesus Christ. Hold on to that. This wholehearted allegiance to Christ and to God and not being caught up in that. Hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to it in a moment. So all of this said, to me, it's really fitting that this passage shows up on a Sunday that we consider Reformation Sunday because This was so much the story in many ways in the 1500s when Martin Luther finally had had it with the leadership of his days. So what were some of the struggles going on? You've got to remember in both these situations, and this is really important. This is where I'm going to show how our situation is similar but different. In both these situations, in Jesus' time and in the Reformation, civic authority and ecclesiastical church authority, if you will, those things weren't intertwined. You did not have this separation of church and state that we have. Religious leaders had civic power and influence. That is different now today. So that's important to note. But in Martin Luther's time, that division was not in place yet. So part of the struggle was the struggle between papal power and emperors and princes. So these people who had, I'll call it governmental power, which it's even hard to separate that way because the Pope had governmental power in a lot of ways. But the religious authorities and these princes and emperors of the hour in Germany particularly, we'll just focus on Germany, but this kind of held true in a lot of Europe. Uh, There was great struggle for power between them. Part of the issue was that the church owned uh, about a fifth to a third of the land in Europe, depending on which country you were in. They owned huge, huge, huge tracts of land. They owned it tax-free. They had no taxes, and they, but they could, ex- they could extract taxes and fees and all kinds of things from the peasants and the peoples who lived on that land. There was a huge disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And the religious authorities were in the former place. They were the haves, right? And they, and they wielded that power very, very, very abusively. There were a couple um, particular things. Um, 
there was what was known as uh, simony, simony, clerical simony. Uh, what that practice was, was it was being able to buy a clerical office, a church office, so that you had authority over a region. Uh, and in a moment you're going to hear this particular issue was one of the ones that threw Martin Luther over the edge when you pair it with another problem and that was that there was this thing going on called the sale of indulgences. And without going into a whole bunch of detail, in short, by making contributions to the church, you could alleviate someone's, you could avoid being in purgatory, this holding zone between life and hell if you were headed to hell, and you could alleviate your time there or perhaps avoid time in purgatory by making contributions. And not only that, but then they extended it to dead people. If your mom or your dad or one of your family members was dead and were in purgatory, you could make these contributions and as a result have their, their misery reduced or eliminated. And, and there, it just went, the list went on and on and on. There also the veneration of saints had gotten to an, an idolatrous level. Priests were, uh, there were all kinds of problem with priests. Many of them had uh, all kinds of affairs or relationships they had no business having. Uh, there were people who held offices but effectively did nothing in it. They just wanted the position of power, but they didn't actually do what they were supposed to do. Uh, and they would hold multiple offices when they should have been able to hold only one. So, all of that said, all this was brewing and stewing, and then there was a, an event that was kind of the perfect storm of these things that threw Martin Luther over the edge. There was a man uh, named Albrecht of Brandenburg. And Albrecht in Brandenburg was brilliant entrepreneur, but an ethical stake in the grass. <laughs> because what Albrecht of Brandenburg did, what he, he borrowed money from a bank. So he gets this money from the Bank of Augsburg, and he takes that money to then buy his way into being the Archbishop of a place called Mainz, the Archbishop of Magdeburg, and the Bishop of Halberstadt. So he bought himself three different offices, and then, so now he has to pay back these loans, right? So what he did was, he then very aggressively went after people for the sale of indulgences and took the money that was contributed and he paid some of that toward the, um, the building of the basilica in Rome. And, you know, this, it was just such a heinous, corrupt mess and Martin Luther got wind of this guy who borrowed money and then basically extracted money in a completely unethical and moral practice from people to pay that money back so he could have power over these regions and continue to then continue to extract money and just make himself a fat, wealthy cat lorded over other people. Sound familiar? Hardship putting hardship on the people, loving his position, loving his status, just like those guys back in Jesus' day who wanted everybody to look at them. And he wanted to be the bishop and the archbishop, and he wanted people to see his power, and he wanted to make as much money off of it as he could, and in the process, tremendous hardship placed on the people. And... This was, it, it got to a point, a few years after Martin Luther nailed the 90, that, that, that event was the catalyst for Martin Luther saying something has to be said, and he 90, nailed these 95 theses on the door. It went on, it, it became a bloodbath. A number of years later, peasants in some of these lands laid out some kind of demands, if you will, and they were simple things like 
We want to be able to hunt on the land that we live on. They were literally starving to death because the owners of those lands, whether they were princes or they were bishops or they were the church or whatever, they would say, no, all, anything that lives on that land, that's ours, you can't hunt it. And if they hunted it, they were considered poachers and they were killed or fined or, you know, these guys couldn't eat, they couldn't eat. It was just one simple thing. There were many, many, many things like that. There were hardships they were facing and they spoke out against them in an extremely short amount of time, about 100,000 of about 300,000 peasants were slaughtered to push down that revolt. So this, this whole Reformation business was not just a battle of ideas. It was bloody, and it was painful. So let's move on. You got a picture of the hardship and the abuse of power and how the kind of things that Jesus was battling, it's like all those ills were on steroids in the Reformation. And Martin Luther, essentially, while Martin Luther attacked many of these practices, the 95 Theses, they actually went to the heart of some of these things. They would go like to sale of indulgences and say, hang on a minute. The Pope can't give what God already freely give, gives to someone with a contrite heart. And basically said, you don't need to be paying for that business because God freely gives it. Okay, that's like the type of thing he was doing. But at the end of the day, what the reformers did was they pointed people back to the basics. They pointed them away from these leaders. They pointed them away from all of these bishops and archbishops and even the Pope and said, no, we need to return to God and we need to return to Jesus Christ. And one of the things that emerged out of the Reformation were what were called the five solas. And I'm just going to hit them very, very quickly, so don't worry, this sermon's not going to go on forever. But there was sola, sola scriptura, which meant the Bible. Only the Bible needs to be our authority. All other authority is beneath Scripture. And so they pointed to Scripture as the highest authority. Sola fide, which was faith alone, that we are saved uh, through faith alone in Jesus Christ. That's it. There, we can, you, can't, you can't buy it. You can't work your way into it. Your salvation only comes through faith alone and by grace of Jesus Christ. Sola gratia. So, Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. And then lastly, and these two just nail on, hit the nail on the head of what Jesus was pounding on, and that was sola, solus Christus, which was Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone as your Lord, your Savior, and your King. No other authority, no other person as an authority over you than Jesus Christ. And lastly, Sole Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. We live for the glory of God alone. Nothing else. We don't live to lift us up. We don't live to have power. We don't live to have status. We are here to lift God up, to praise God, to glorify God. God is our one and only Heavenly Father, if you will. So, at the end of the day, those reformers were calling people away from that grabbing at power and saying, no, 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 no. Come back to God. Come back to Jesus Christ as our authorities and as the one that we give glory and honor to, not ourselves. Now today... And I want to wrap up. I'm not, like I said, I don't want this thing to go on forever and ever, though we're covering 2,000 years of history or some high points along the way. Today, we stand at a really tumultuous time. And there appears to be more and more discord between people struggling on the bottom and people who have power and authority and means at the top. There just seems to be a growing discontent 
and a growing gap at many, many levels in our society and culture. Now, something that's very different in this whole thing was that in the biblical times and in the time of Reformation, the church had this sort of civic authority, which we don't have anymore. In fact, the church, our culture has tried to marginalize the church and marginalized God in many, many ways. We have tried to take the church, the people of God, and push them to the side in our culture. And I think that our calling has not changed despite that difference in context. Despite the fact that we have a different role. It might even be better that that's the case because it is harder for us to, as the church if we don't have civic responsibility in the sense of governmental authority over people's lives. It is much harder for us to be caught up in some of those abuses. We can still abuse who we are and what we are. And religious leaders could try to point to themselves and take advantage of people. And that does happen in the church. But we stand aside in some ways, and yet I think our witness that we're called to is the very same witness. Our witness we're called to is not to throw in our allegiance with any given cause or authority or power or uh, party, not to throw our allegiance behind these talking points, though they may be good things, and we might need to listen to those things. Like, it may be truth that's being lifted up that we're hearing, even within civic arguments and civic discussion, if you will. There may be good words that are being said and good ideas that are being said. But our allegiance needs to be to God and to Jesus Christ first and foremost. And I think we need to quite verbally and visually do that. Not in a way that points to ourselves, but that points to and glorifies God. That we need to stand steadfast as children of the King with an identity rooted in God as our Heavenly Father, with our identity rooted in being followers of Jesus Christ and Christ alone in a time when people are losing their ever-loving minds and heads and being caught up at grabbing for power and influence and self-edification. We need to avoid that game and we need to avoid falling into the trap of idolizing people or movements or anything like that. We've got everything we need within Jesus Christ. His grace is sufficient for all things. And we can do nothing greater or better than to bring grace to the world, to bring Christ to the world. There's nothing that can compete with that. So let us stand steadfast steadfast to being witnesses to the gospel in tumultuous times. Praise be to God that God would honor us with the opportunity to do that. Amen. <laughs> Let's join in prayer. Holy God, we have an amazing amount of freedom. In Jesus' day, people who spoke up against the religious authorities got crucified, as Jesus did. People in Martin Luther's time who stood up and spoke out about the burdens that were being placed upon them by the religious authorities of that hour, they were slaughtered. We stand in a time where we have burdens on people's backs that ought not be there. Some of it has happened just because of circumstance, because we have a pandemic and it's tearing things up economically. 
And there's no one to blame for that. That's part of just life. Some of those things are happening because of the exploitation of people in businesses or who just, they're taking advantage of a terrible situation. Shame on them, and God let us not get caught up in being a part of that. But God, we have tremendous freedom. If we speak up about things that are untruths, if we speak up about burdens that are being placed on people, we're going to take some hits, there's no doubt about it. We are going to struggle within the culture around us. And we may be shamed, but odds are we're not going to lose our life over it, not our physical life. And even if we did, Lord, Paul, who when his life hung in a tenuous balance and was threatened, Paul said, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Because he was a man of faith, he was a man of believer, and he a man of belief, and he understood that your grace is sufficient for all things. We don't have to turn to anything else. Your grace is sufficient for all things. So Lord, guide us, lead us to be steadfast in our allegiance to you, O Lord. We may listen to the message that is brought in some of what is being is moving right now in our culture. There are voices who are speaking truth. And they may not even be within the church. They're just calling out and they're hitting the right notes. And if that's the case, then we need to do as we hear, but again, not follow the example of people who are abusing their power, not following the example of people who are acting in ways that are not Christ-like, not submitting our allegiance to anything but you and your glory and following your son's teaching. Again, thank you so much for making us members of your family. For that, we are truly blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, normally this is time in worship where there would be a communion plate up here and we would pass it around to folks and we can't do that. So, uh, I'm going to tell you two simple ways that you can give to support ministry here at First Presbyterian Church. And I also want to say a big thank you to everyone who has and continues to support us. Uh, first one is very simple. You can write a check and you can mail that to uh, P.O. Box 214, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, 72476. Or another simple, easy, and safe way to give is to go online to our website at fpcwalnutridge.org forward slash give. And when you go there, you're going to find a, a big button you press. And when you press that button, it's going to take you to a secure site where you can then enter your contribution information and make a tax-deductible gift. So again, thank you so much. And let's honor God for all the gifts God gives us by singing together now the doxology. join me in asking God's blessing on the gifts we've given today. Holy Lord, we have given you but a small portion of what we have received, but we've put it in your hands, and your hands are miraculous hands, and you can do things with these gifts that we never would have thought of or even imagined possible. So we're asking your blessing upon these gifts to multiply them and turn them into ministries that affect people's lives and bring them to a place of knowing your love more deeply. 
In Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen. And let's prepare our hearts now for communion by singing together our communion hymn, which today is, Let Us Break Bread Together. Welcome to the joyful feast of the people of God. This isn't our table. It's not the table of First Presbyterian Church. It is not the table of the PCUSA. It is not the table of the elders or the pastor. This is the Lord's table. And because of that, all who believe in Him are invited to come and take part in this great sacrament together. What a blessing that is to be family and to be gathered at table. And it's a big table. We're told that in God's kingdom, people are going to come from east and west and north and south and they're all going to gather and they're going to be at His great banquet. As we receive these gifts, it's not just a meal of remembrance. We're not simply looking back on what Jesus did long ago. But Jesus is alive. He's a living Lord. So we are re-experiencing Him right now in this sacrament. And it doesn't end there because there are promises that God made and that He fulfills in Jesus Christ that are yet to come. Someday, as I said a moment ago, we're going to eat his, at His great banquet and this is a reminder that that is, of things yet to come. So it's a big table. It stretches around the world and it stretches throughout time. Welcome to it. Now, let's join our hearts in prayer. Please join me in reading the people's part in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Indeed, Lord, it is right and good to give our thanks and praise. So we come before you with joy. We are joyful that your love is everlasting. We praise you that in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, all the promises you had given by the prophets were fulfilled and the day of our deliverance has dawned. As we look for the triumph of His kingdom, we exult with holy joy. How wonderful are Your ways, Almighty God. We praise You, Most Holy God, for sending Your only Son, Jesus, to live among us, full of grace and truth. He made You known to all who received Him, sharing our joy and sorrow he healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still a friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. And Lord, hear now our prayers 
as we pray the words that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, remembering the Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest, each time we break this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again to the world. The Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest took bread and after he blessed it, he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. In a similar way, he took up the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. Try this again. Remembering the Lord Jesus, we break this bread and we drink this cup, proclaiming his life and death to all the nations until he comes again. We are told that on the night of his arrest, Jesus, after blessing bread, broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. The bread of life. Eat all of it. In a similar way, he took up the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. A cup of salvation, drink all of it. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. We give ourselves to you and ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom. May our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For a closing hymn, I picked something maybe a little bit unusual that we usually would sing only probably around the 4th of July. But I picked out My Country Tis of Thee for closing worship today for two reasons. One, as I look back at what the reformers went through and the tremendous amount of control and power that was wielded at that time, it was a very oppressive time for, for people and the freedom that came out of the Reformation. 
And I look at the fact that here in the United States, maybe somebody's watching this from, from abroad, but here in the United States, we stand just two days before an election, and I am reminded as we stand before this election that uh, we have just an amazing amount of freedom. We have freedom here to be able to go and vote and democratically select our leaders, but we also have freedom to worship unaccosted. We can walk into this sanctuary on a Sunday morning or gather in someone's home and worship as we please, and we don't have to fear uh, any kind of persecution for that from, from a government uh, or the military in some way. So mindful of that this morning, uh, we're singing My Country Tis of Thee to give thanks for the freedom that we enjoy and to honor God for the freedoms God has given us in Christ. <laughs> Once again, it has been awesome to worship with you today, and if this is your first time with us to worship, we hope you'll be back again either virtually or if you want to come on a Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. every Sunday, we're here. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, if this has been a blessing, uh, before we go, I would encourage you to, wherever you're watching it, press a share button, maybe send it to a friend. Uh, copy the link, drop it in an email or text to somebody who needs a blessing today. And what a wonderful, simple, easy way to spread uh, the goodness you have felt today in encountering God. So now, as we go forth from this place, be encouraged. We have a big, an amazing, a wondrous God who transforms the world through common everyday folk just like us. He's not done with us yet. So, as you go forth this week, know that the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with you in a powerful and a wondrous way. And all God's children said, Amen. <laughs>